So as a data scientist, there are lots of probability distributions you need to know. But what are the most commonly used ones? Hey guys, it's Emma. Welcome back to my channel. In this video, I want to share with you the top three distributions in data science interviews. I think people have different interview experience and their selections might be different from mine. So I'm going to talk about the three probability distributions that I have seen the most often in data science interviews. And they are the normal distribution, binomial distribution, and the geometric distribution. We will not only talk about these distributions, but also show you some real-life applications of these distributions. We will cover questions such as why normal distribution is so commonly used, what does success mean in a binomial distribution, and how to use geometric distribution to obtain customer lifetime. I hope this video serves as a refresher for you when you review your probability knowledge. Even better, you can learn a few new things from this video. Without further ado, let's get started with the normal distribution, which is by far the most common distribution that I have seen in data science interviews. The normal distribution, or what is sometimes referred to as the Gaussian distribution, is a very common distribution for continuous data. Given its resemblance to a bell, the distribution is also known as a bell curve. The main reason for the popularity of this distribution is the central limit theorem, which states that the sampling distribution of the means follows a normal distribution no matter what the underlying distribution of the population is. Yes, that's right. Our population can be as strange as possible, but if we repeatedly draw samples from it, the distribution of the sample means will be normally distributed like a bell curve. The rule of thumb is to draw at least 30 samples. But if the population is very skewed, we need a much larger sample size for the central limit theorem to be accurate. Note that the normal distribution is not just a one curve, it's a collection of curves, each of which is determined by its mean and the standard deviation. The mean is the highest point in the normal distribution, and the standard deviation measures the amount of variability or dispersion of a set of values. This allows us to select the most appropriate distribution from the collection of normally distributed curves. Now, let's consider an example. Let's say we want to estimate the average time spent per user per day on a website. So we randomly select 10 users and calculate the average time they spend per day on our website. We iterate this process, say, a thousand times, and plot the averages we obtain each time. So if we look at it on a graph, the x-axis will be the average time spent per day among all users, and the y-axis is the frequency. What is the distribution of the average time spent? This is a normal distribution, right? This is because of central limit theorem, which tells us that we do not need to know the distribution of the population. If we draw repeated samples and take the average of them, the distribution of the sample means will soon resemble a normal distribution. So how about if instead of the average time spent per user per day, we want to look at the total time spent by all users per day. That is, we sum up all the time spent across all users for a day. So if we plot it on a graph, the x-axis is the total time spent per day across all users, and the y-axis is the frequency. Is it a different distribution? Well, as it turns out, this also follows a normal distribution because the central limit theorem for sums tells us that if we keep drawing sufficiently large samples and take their sums, the sums also follow a normal distribution. Because of the central limit theorem, the normal distribution is widely used to model sampling distributions. Because again, even when the underlying population does not follow a normal distribution, the sample statistics do. As that being said, the underlying population really follows a normal distribution in reality. In fact, most raw data you see in reality follows a distribution that is more accurately described as a long-tailed. It has a long tail on either the left side or the right side. For example, the distribution of time spent on social media is a long-tailed distribution. According to a research from Facebook, very few people actually spend more than three hours on the site per day, with the vast majority spending about one hour. Now, let's move forward to another common use distribution, the binomial distribution. It is for discrete data. Like the normal distribution, the binomial distribution is a collection or family of curves. The shape of their probability mass function is determined by two variables, the probability of success, p, and the total number of trials, n. Success means obtaining the outcome of interest, and it can be defined however you choose to do, as long as the event has a binary outcome and success refers to one of the outcomes. 
A simple example of a binomial distribution would be the number of heads among a specific number of tosses of a coin. Now let's consider a more practical example. An advertisement has a click through rate that is calculated by the total number of clicks over the total number of impressions. What is the distribution of the total number of clicks? That is a simple question, right? It follows a binomial distribution because it has a binary outcome and we are counting the number of successes. How about the clicks rate? What is the distribution of clicks rate? It's also a binomial distribution, but it's a normalized binomial distribution or a Bernoulli distribution because it's not the total number of successes, it's the success rate. Similar to clicking and not clicking, if we have other binary outcomes such as purchasing or not purchasing a product or subscribing or not subscribing to a particular service, we can use a binomial distribution to measure the total number of successes, with success defined as occurrence of the event of interest. We can consider a purchase as a success or a cancellation event as a success. So the binary distribution is a very common use in reality to measure the total number of events of interest. The last distribution we're going to talk about today is geometric distribution. Before we talk about geometric distribution, it's helpful to know the negative binomial distribution. From its name, you might guess it is related to the binomial distribution, and that's right. It is also a discrete distribution. This distribution represents the number of successes before a specific number of failures occur. Again, success and the failure are arbitrary terms. You can define them however you choose as long as they are binary outcomes. A simple example of a negative binomial distribution is the number of heads that come up before the tenth tail comes up. The geometric distribution is a special case of the negative binomial distribution, and it represents the distribution of the number of trials needed to get the first success. Sometimes it also refers to the number of trials needed before the first success. The difference between the two is the one includes the first success, while the other excludes the first success. Both are geometric distributions, and the choice of which to use depends on convenience and the context. The one parameter for the geometric distribution is p, the probability of success. As you can see from the graph on the slide, the two definitions share the same shape in terms of their probability mass function. But the first one, the one that includes the first success, is shifted over 1 on the x-axis because it includes the first success. The geometric distribution is commonly used in reality, and one common use case is to calculate customer lifetime giving customer churn rate. Let's see how we can obtain it. Suppose the monthly churn rate is C. It refers to the proportion of existing customers who churn in a month, and that is constant over time. What we want to find is, on average, how many months it takes for a customer to churn, or the average customer lifetime. In this case, we define success as churning, and our success rate is the monthly churn rate C. Note that we will be using the first definition of the geometric distribution to calculate the number of months up to and including the first month when a user actually churns. What we want for the average customer lifetime is actually the expectation of a geometric distribution, and that is 1 over C. It means on average it takes 1 over C months for a customer to churn. In other words, the average customer lifetime is 1 over C. So if C is 10%, the customer lifetime is 10 months. If C is 20%, the customer lifetime is 5 months. That's how we can use the geometric distribution to find customer lifetime, assuming the churn rate is constant. All right, guys, we have discussed three distributions, the normal distribution, the binomial distribution, and the geometric distribution. These three distributions are commonly seen in data science interviews, and they are frequently used in practice as well. I hope by now you have a better understanding of those distributions. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to this channel to get updates about future content. I will see you in the next video.